Now, we have a real treat for you. This is Larry King. You remember him of Garlic Breath fame? Larry King was on. He's thrown off radio and he's thrown off television. He doesn't exist anymore. He's not a player. Larry King has no, no show at all. And apparently he's bitter. <clears throat> so he goes on to a webcast show, a guy I never heard of. Maybe the guy's good, bit. I don't know. And listen to what Larry King had to say. That was the beginning of talk radio. Mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of credit as the beginning of talk radio in America. And Do you like what it evolved into? No, because it became a soapbox, screaming, yelling idiots, and a lot of what I hear is pop nonsense. And yeah, political. No real, dis yeah, no real discussion. Yeah, no real discussion. Political crazies. Mm -hmm. You know, NPR is good radio, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the, the Limbaugh's and these yeah. guys are just. Uh, playing with a loose deck, yeah, and a lot of it's an act. So oh, I know, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, they're uh, they're hot. There's some of good work. I came to respect Howard Stern. Now I I can't make this up. This man is either senile or he's always been a dummy from Brooklyn. I don't know, or both may be true, or he's OD'd on garlic and his brain is fried. I don't understand it. He says we're too political in talk radio, but he really respects the broadcaster Howard Stern <laughs> because he's the real McCoy. Talking about politics is no good. Obama's still going to... All right. That's good. I got the newspapers. Uh, Iran and North Korea secretly developing new long-range rocket booster for ICBMs. This is a day after they announced this. Iranian missile technicians secretly visited North Korea as part of joint development of a new rocket booster for long-range missiles or space launchers. At the same time, nuclear talks took place in Geneva, according to U.S. officials. How's that, Larry King? Put that in your garlic mouth and shove it. Maybe, maybe Howard Stern can give you better information, you stupid moron. It's too much seltzer your whole life, you old idiot, you. All that carbon dioxide went to your brain. You got global warming of the mind, Larry. All those little bubbles. There's a song, Little Bubbles. Little Bubbles. In your case, Larry, you've OD'd on carbon dioxide of the brain. You hear? He doesn't want to hear news or politics, Larry King. It's not American to give out news or politics to Larry King. Just entertainment so you can wind up a slime ball like Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, Ratzenberg, and Hatzenberg. Okay. I, I said I wouldn't get mad, and I'm not getting mad. I'm not going to get angry. I refuse. I refuse. I refuse. I swear I refuse. Yep, Cleveland, Larry. No, it says WMAL. That's not Cleveland. That's Washington, D.C. Larry, you're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Uh, face value, back door, front door. When the drone landed in Iran accidentally, that was the face value. But then I noticed the tablecloth taped to the leading edge of the wing of the drone hiding what was up underneath it, and that was the back door. And now that that didn't work, they're going to go fly right in the front door with their inspections delivering. Do you remember when that drone was so-called, our most advanced drone was sent by Obama to Iran as a gift? I was the only one who said that was not an accident. Somebody in the military sent that to Iran as a present so they could reverse engineer it. Do you remember that? I certainly do. I saw it for what it was. There was a traitor in that White House from day one. People just won't wake up to the fact that we're breaking. He fired nine generals, nine combat generals. What has to happen till these schmucks like Chaim Sabin wake up? What has to happen? Genocide until they won't, they won't stop until they get it. John Kerry said... Let me tell you something. Genocide wouldn't stop them from laughing at his lame jokes. They would laugh as the Titanic was going down. John Kerry said that... Uh, well, the reporter asked him, and he said, well, you you got to, the end result, you got to start at the beginning with something small, just like they're doing to us, just like Obamacare and everything else. The end result, and they start with a little piece. Okay, I hear you on the drone. I knew what it was. I put it in trickle-down tyranny. I wrote about the drone. Eight, five, up. I realize I'm not as intelligent as Larry King who said that we're just shooting off our mouths. And his, his role model, Larry King, the, thing he, the guy he thinks is really great in, in radio is NPR. You hear this? A government, a government front group, NPR, is his idea of great radio, or Howard Stern. Well, I, I can't keep up to uh, Howard Stern's level of broadcasting, but I'll do the best I can after 30 books and a, and a Ph.D. I'll see the best, do the best I possibly can do. I'm not a balloon man from Scarsdale. I've given you some ideas. You can comment. How's this for a question? 
Who are the biggest traitors in the American media? I could put it in a more abrupt manner, such as who have become lapdogs instead of watchdogs, which is supposed, which is what the media has always supposed to have been. We are the fourth estate. We're supposed to be watchdogs, not lapdogs. Now, a guy like Larry King always was a lapdog. He was very successful in the beginning because no one knew any better. You know, I, I got to tell you a story, Larry King's story. Many years ago, 1981, I believe, I was on a book tour for one of my books. I don't remember which. I don't. It was a health book, actually. I do remember it was a health book. And I went to his mutual studios in Washington, D.C. one evening. Now that I think about it, it was a dark night, so he was on at night. That's right. So I'm in the night shift now. Oh, I can't wait for the day shift. Wow. Man, by the time 6 o'clock rolls around on the West Coast, I've done eight shows in my head. And so <clears throat> I was on a Larry King show, and he had a very interesting re um, interviewing technique. I was told he wouldn't read the author's book until the author was sitting in the studio, and then he'd open it up like a guy in a bookstore and look at the cover and ask questions, which was very clever, and by the way, a very good format for, for asking questions. And I thought he was a good broadcaster. Now, why he became what he has become is sad in a way. And uh, you could joke and say it's age. It probably is. But time and gravity catches up with all of us. The brain starts to go. As uh, one of my former professors, when I was getting my doctorate, uh, told me, the first thing to go on the elderly is their judgment. So, Larry, I'm sorry to say you're probably a very nice guy, but your judgment has gone. And you just, it's, it's not sour grapes, Larry King, what it is. I would say it's uh, rotten garlic. Too much, too much garlic. That's so. Uh, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. What can you do? Fundraisers for a man like it's a disgrace. When did it become legal for a president to hijack Air Force One and use it for fundraising without reimbursing the public? When? When did that begin? Who did it first? How'd they get away with it? Who did this first? How can they hijack Air Force One like this? Go to clip two. Let's hear that one. Entertainment is one of America's biggest exports. And every day you sell a product that's made in America to the rest of the world. Every time somebody buys movie tickets or DVDs or distribution rights to a film, mm -hmm. some of that money goes back to the local economy right here. And believe is it or that not, why they're blowing up American embassies? Of because of the sewer pipe American that those vermin... It's part of that's American diplomacy putting out degeneracy and sickness and violence? Such a world power. Did you hear what he just said? Hollywood is part of our diplomacy by putting out the, ver the, the garbage Jeffrey Katzenberg puts out. Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg put out a sewer pipe of filth to the world. And they're now, uh, uh, they're now representing our foreign policy? No wonder Al-Qaeda thinks we're a bunch of weaklings and sickos who deserve to die. If you were living in a traditional Muslim society and you saw degenerates every day in Hollywood movies... And weaklings every day in Hollywood movies. What would you think of America? Thank you, Katzenberg, for being such a great diplomat. Well, uh, you know how I feel about the Hollywood idiots. You know, I mean, you know how I feel about it. 855 I have so many stories, I don't have the guts to even read them to you. It's so bad. <laughs> no, the news is so horrible. It's so depressing, I can't even look at it. I'm sticking to Hollywood because if I read the news stories, you're liable to commit suicide. Iran and North Korea secretly developing new long-range rocket booster for ICBMs. Iranian news agency today published a, leg a text of the nuclear deal, and it shows that they have the right to build a bomb. Thank you, Chaim Sabin. Your Israeli compatriots must, must be very proud of you. Must be so proud of you, Chaim. You came to America and did so well. Anyone have anything to say about any of this? Because I'll take your calls at 855-107282. Look, let's start with the reality. It's Tuesday night. We're on the cusp of Thanksgiving. I don't blame you if you don't want to hear about uh, the news or politics. I get it. But you know what? That's the nature of my show. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. You can say, may the force be with you. They know what you're talking about. Hundreds of millions of people may never set foot in the United States, but thanks to you, 
They've experienced a small part of what makes our country special. They've learned the something about plant. our values. We have shaped values. a world culture through you. Harvey Weinstein has values? That's a value to you. Like many before him, Obama reeling from a string of domestic scandals desperately needs a foreign policy success at any cost. Fortunately, he has an unlimited number of concessions he can make to our adversaries who will bite off his fingers. Then off to Hollywood to bask in the glow of a fawning yet politically naive fan club. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. He is a disgrace. A disgrace. But Chaim Sabin is a bigger disgrace. Well, the one thing is, though, is, you know, there's Barry again hanging out with the small people. Because he hates the rich. As you know, he hates the rich. You could also never go to another movie by any of them. I mean, you could have done that, but what, what effect is that going to have? Huh? Whatever. I can't take anymore. I, I mean, the stuffing came up. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even eat it yet. I feel like the stuffing's coming up, and I haven't even had it yet. I called them Lexus liberals a long time ago, but they don't drive Lexi. The fact is they all drive um, hybrid cars. They once told by... Um, one of the big agencies, creative artist agency, you had to drive a Prius. I was once at one of these houses driving by. I knew someone next door. Every car, there were 200 cars in the street, without exception, was a hybrid. They didn't dare drive anything bigger for fear that the overboss would uh, condemn them, you know, ostracize them. What a bunch of children they are. Whatever. Tom Hanks. Some, some people have heard me say... Uh, you know, my list of top five movies, you know, The Godfather 1 and 2 have to be on it. But it turns out Marlon Brando had it easy because when it comes to Congress, there's no such thing as an offer they can't refuse. I mean, I just keep yet. on coming back. Oh. I'm going to keep on trying, though. Well, you could make them an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> you have the NSA, you have the FBI, CIA. You could make uh, the... the, the uh, the brave men of the Republican Party and offer they can't refuse. Seems like you have already. Okay. If you're a family person, a man or a woman, and you are raising two children in America, and you're both working, and you, you take a look at your paycheck when you come home, and you see that 50% of it is stolen by the gangsters in the government, and then you see your children coming home with pants hanging down underneath their, their behind, and you're the father who comes home white in the face from working so hard. Tell me what that father thinks about liberalism. The father becomes an instant conservative. He takes the son's pants and he throws them into a fireplace. And he tells the kids, straighten up or I'll throw you out of the house. You're not going to become a gangbanger in my house. I work too hard. And sometimes it works because if you go the other way, the, ch the child is lost to you. And let me tell you something else. These fathers are tough. They're strong, they're old world fathers, and they know that conservative values are the only thing that will sustain their family, nothing else. You think they want their son to marry their boyfriend? You think they want their daughters to marry their girlfriend? I mean, let's be blunt about it. We're not allowed to say it anymore. They're very conservative people socially. That's what their culture is. They're very Catholic. They're more conservative than, than, than the, uh, the Fugazi priests that they go to. Sorry to be so blunt, but uh, I was given a, an extra gene, a blunt gene. I found it out. I did a uh, genetics test, and they discovered that I, they discovered I had an extra gene. It was called a, a B gene, a blunt gene. So pardon me. I can't help it. I'll be right back. <laughs> Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Yeah, but don't attack one ethnic group for being overly liberal. I mean, we know there's a tremendous uh, disproportionate number of liberals amongst Jewish people, but amongst uh, Irish people, it's no different. And who just won the mayorship in New York? A man of the t Italian descent who makes Jewish liberals look like conservatives. And now the Pope himself today comes out and shows himself to be a, a radical leftist. Tax capitalism and calls for basically more welfare. He calls the tyranny of the markets evil. Can you believe it? I mean, this is the new pope. Comes out and says the, the capitalism is evil. Can you believe this? That the church should fight poverty. And he says uh, this, he says that. End to society's obsession with money. 
Me always standing in front of a, go a golden chair and, and silver urns. Yeah, okay, so what's new under the sun? Francis, age 70, has called on leaders of the world over to guarantee people dignified work, education, and health care. That's communism. Dignified work, education, and health care for the whole world, all five billion or so people. That's communism. In the exhortation called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. Well, let me tell you something, Pope. There's no joy in having my hard-earned money given to bums. There's no joy in seeing able-bodied men walking around not doing anything, Pope. So where do you want to turn for any sanity? The Pope? Tell me where you're going to turn. You can get into a state where everything looks bleak. And, and, and where do you go with that? You can't win with that. You just can't win. I go there myself. Every man goes into these phases of the dark passage. We know that. I mean, I've read Winston Churchill's biography, and he went into these black moods. And I, he called him the black dog, I think, or something like that. And he would go into these absolute depressions from which he would return with good ideas. And I have used my depressions my whole life to be very creative. I, I don't want to go into it because then it'll be a, a, it's too much of a sob story, and I, I'm not going to go there. I don't medicate. I don't want anyone to help me when I get in those moods. I just sulk. And if you look at the productivity in my life of the almost 30 books that I have authored, etc., on a daily show, you can see that the sulking is actually a positive thing. Not all depression is negative. We live in a demented society where if you have a human emotion that's down, they think you're sick. And the psychos sell you a drug. Where is it written the human being is supposed to walk around like a happy camper every minute? Where that's the normal human state? I didn't say you should be depressed. I didn't say that's the normal human state. Human emotions are uh, operational on a sine curve by my best estimation. You know, an up and a down, and I've told you this before. I'm a very natural man. I live next to the water some of the time, and I watch the tides. There are four tides a day. And if you come to understand there are two highs and two lows in the tides, you may come to understand that the same cycles of ups and downs occur in the human being naturally. We are, I was going to say biological creatures, but I wanted to change it to something else. Some would say we are electromagnetical creatures. Let's just put it this way. We are subject to forces outside of our own will. And if you try to medicate those changes in yourself, you'll probably knock off your natural cycle. So what I'm saying is if you go down and up and down and up, that doesn't mean you're a manic depressive or bipolar. That's a medical description to sell you a pill to make you a flatliner. Go with your emotions, but work them. Work them if you're down, so use your down. When you're down, you can look up. Whenever you're down, look to the mountaintop. When you're on the mountaintop, look at the valley, and you'll understand that you're a human being, and life is a long journey, and through this journey, you walk through many valleys, and you achieve mountaintops, and go over the mountaintop, and what's on the bottom? And you, once you get to the mountaintop, what's on the other side? Another valley. And in, the, in your day, if you look at your day and you don't medicate yourself, or you don't drink alcohol, or you don't use stimulants, I can guarantee you that there are cycles of two ups and two downs. I could create an entire new field of psychotherapy based upon what I just said to you. Because there's no medication required. There's almost no therapy required. It's just recognizing who we are. Then we got the Pope coming out. I mean, it was a pretty shocking thing that the Pope said. And I think it's worth discussing because it's controversial. Pope calls for anti-capitalist and more welfare. Credo. You want me to quote it and see what you think? Pope Francis decried the unfettered capitalism that has created a new tyranny and an idolatry of money Tuesday in his first major work as pontiff. Can you believe this? Francis, age 76, called on leaders of the world over to guarantee, quote, dignified work, education, and health care in the exhortation called the Evangelii Glaudium, the joy of the gospel. Now, you understand what will happen if you have income redistribution of this at this level. And you understand that the President of the United States, while living the highest life possible, is preaching the same gospel. So do you think this is a simple welfare mentality? I do. What do you think the Pope means? That's the first question. 
This is a message of the first non-European pontiff in 1,300 years. It reflects the influence, the influence of liberation theology, which, by the way, is the same theology that animated President Obama's preacher, Reverend Wright. Liberation theology is a political movement with roots in Latin America that tied the teachings of Jesus Christ to radical opposition of the social and economic conditions that create poverty, meaning communism. So now you have a pope who is preaching liberation theology along the lines of Rev Reverend Jeremiah Wright. You have the most powerful man in the world, the president, preaching liberation theology. You have billionaire Jews in Hollywood preaching liberation theology. So who speaks for the average middle class person? Well, okay, that's one man's statement. You know, it's a pretty comprehensive statement I just made. And it's pretty educated, by the way. When I tell you what the Pope just said is reflecting the influence of liberation theology, I didn't make it up. Colin in Connecticut on WABC, fire away, you're on the Savage Nation. Hi, Michael. I'm a big fan. I'm also a Catholic priest. And um, I think your take on the Pope's um, writings here are, are incorrect really. Um, the Pope, or let me put it to you this way, I, I preach or my parish is in an affluent area, Fairfield County, and um, I mean, I grew up in this area, so I have said to the people in the homily, in the homily before that I think 1,000 square feet is enough for a person to live in, okay? Well, you mean a person should be limited by the government to a thousand square feet? I'm saying a person should limit oneself. That in terms of. Right, but what if a person doesn't want to limit to one? What if they want to live in twelve hundred square feet, or twelve thousand, or fifteen thousand, or like Chaim Sabin in a fifty thousand square foot mansion? Should they not be allowed to? The the Pope is saying that it's not in keeping with Christian values to be extravagant in our... Um... But th you have to understand that this is a rather new message from the Catholic Church. He is the first non-European pontiff in 1,300 years. His speech reflects the influence of liberation theology, which is as leftist as you can ever find. Yeah, but no, I mean, you can't, you can't let them spin it. You actually have to read the document. But, I mean, the, the popes have, have, have written about workers' rights and the right to unionize and all that kind of stuff for over 120 years. So this is not... Well, the Vatican is reputedly hoarding a treasure trove estimated at 10 to $15 billion, so why don't they begin by dispersing their own, their own fortune? With priceless art. You're gonna... Well, why don't they sell off the priceless art and give the money to the poor? I'm sure they'll be rewarded. They'll probably face a knockout game as soon as they give them the money. You see, the, the, Jesus said the poor will always be with us. That, that's exactly right. That's right. The Bible says that. The Bible says the poor will always be with us. So how can you, t how can you, you know that if there, you know there are people on this planet, no matter what you give them, they're going to, they're going to squander it and still be poor. You, as, as a Catholic, okay, you're called to live a simple life, to be conservative in your, in your, in how you expend your money, and to give generously to charity. But how can you give generously if you're poor? Um, no, you... The Pope wants you to live in 1,000 square feet, and what should he say? You should be limited to earning $12,000 a year? Then how are you going to help the poor? Where's the, where's the money going to come from for the poor? I have preached to people in my parish who are making $12 million a year, okay? And, and, and what? And they, they agree with you they should live in 1,000 square feet? I don't care. What my, it's not my job whether they agree with me or not. Uh, that's not that's not how I preach. Whether somebody agrees with me or not, I preach the gospel values. Um, can I say one other thing? You can say anything you like, because I respect a man like yourself who leads a simple life. I think that you are to be admired, but I do not want a church or a state to tell me how I should live my life. Well, if the Pope is our religious leader. And to be a true Christian, I mean, we do have a we have, we have people. I don't do it, but there is such thing as about poverty, where our religious leaders, um, you know, they they, they forego material. Well, where would the money come from for the poor if everyone was poor? 
If everyone took a vow of poverty, where would the money come from to help the poor? Does, 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 uh... I don't think you understand something, and that is that in order for there to be any kind of welfare, there must be productive members of society who can produce enough money for themselves and others. I'm, I'm very conservative, and I want to grow the economy. I want, and I... But how can you grow an economy when you're telling people to be poor? No, he's not telling us to be poor. He's telling the rich to be responsible for those who truly are poor. All right, so let's see. I pay 50-some-odd percent of my income in taxes. Is that not enough? How much more shall I pay for the, for the poor? I, I, I'm asking a simple question. The state takes 12, 15 percent. The federal government takes 40 percent. Everything I buy is taxed to death. How much more should I give for the poor? Do you have a charitable giving fund? Well, let's start with what I give in taxes. It's over 50 percent of my income. Every dollar I earn, 50 percent is filched from me by the government. Let's start with that, every dollar. I get less than 50 cents on the dollar. And I've given quite a significant amount of money away to various organizations, which I will not mention. Come to charity. And, then, and by the way, they're mainly animal, animal organizations because my compassion leads me to want to protect the truly vulnerable of our earth, and those would be the elephants, the mountain gorillas, uh, dogs that are left to run wild in the streets before they're thrown into a, into a, into a, a, a gas chamber. I feel badly for animals. I also suffer from depression, and I want to say that you are a little irritated about what you say about medication, because medication really works for me. And if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be functioning right now. So It could be that if you, well, I, I don't want to be flippant or comedic in the political arena, but... You know, I just heard two things from you. One is that you've taken a vow of poverty and you're depressed and that you think others should take somewhat of a almost vow of poverty and that's your depression speaking. I mean, you know, I, I think that maybe living in such a bleak world is depressing. So material... And, 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 and you as a Catholic priest see only, only the, 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 uh, the injured, the suffering people of the earth that can get to you. Mother, Mother Teresa herself was depressed most of her life, according to her biography, which you probably know. Is that correct? Bring us happiness. No, but wasn't, isn't it true that Mother Teresa herself, a saintly woman, was very depressed most of her life and even doubted the existence of God toward, to, in many phases of her life? She said, she wrote that. To a desert. But you with your boats, you found... Do, do, you, do you... Okay, go on, say that again. Me with my boats... Yeah, the boats, your, boat, your big boats that you buy and you don't want, and they don't bring you happiness. Who said they don't bring me happiness? Well, you get rid of them after a couple of years. <laughs> after five years, you have to get rid of them. It's not <laughs> they didn't bring me happiness. They require a lot of work, but they bring me to nature, and I happen to find nature to be the eternal sal salvation in my life. The let, let me tell you something. If I'm on a boat alone with my dog, let's say, I don't go to party on a boat. Some do. God bless them. That's what they like. I like to hear the water against the hull. I like to watch the birds. I like to watch the seals, the wave formations, the clouds, the wind. I watch all of those things, and it, 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 it puts me in touch with a more primal part of myself, and I forget myself, by the way, when I'm on the water. I don't think that's a bad thing. Do you, Father? No, I, lo I love walking on the beach, too. I can't afford a boat, but I I'm just saying materialism does not bring us happiness. Yes, but that's an old statement. But let's put it to you this way. Rich or poor, it's good to have money, isn't it? It is. In other words, if you have a choice to be unhappy and rich and live in a nice, comfortable house with a warm bed and a, as much food as you want and an occasional drink, or to be out in the gutter, you would choose the house, obviously, wouldn't you? So, so in other words, where do you want to go with your liberation theology? Should we all be living in a mud hut to make people in Somalia feel better? You're, you're distorting the message of, of the Pope. I'm sorry. Well, I know. I'm a pretty good student of uh, left-wing philosophy, and he is, he is espousing liberation theology, which is extremely disturbing. To be very honest, Father, and I respect you. I appreciate your hard work for the poor, but I think I'm correct. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. 
So the new pope, the first non-Western pope in 1,400 years, uh, affirms that society is rotten. He wants to fight poverty, and he basically calls for the redistribution of wealth. Pope Francis says that people should enjoy, quote, dignified work, education, and health care. Now, that sounds good on paper, right? So he's preaching a form of liberation theology. It's the first non-European pontiff in 1,300 years. He's reflecting the influence of liberation theology. It's tied to the teachings of Jesus Christ, yes. However, it comes also to be tied to Che Guevara and to the radical opposition of the social and economic conditions that create poverty, meaning communism or socialism. That's how I see it. It's shocking, by the way, and Catholics should come to understand what's going on in their church, the way Americans should come to understand what's going on in their White House. A woman writes, good grief, I'm a Catholic. The Pope does not understand capitalism is helpful in the fight against poverty. Capitalism does not cause poverty. Capitalism is the best way for poor people to, quote, get out of poverty. This sharing the wealth mentality is just the code word for progressives and socialists. The same philosophy used to promote communism. We see it in the United States used by our POTUS. It does not work. Look at Obamacare, just a form of massive wealth redistribution. The woman ends by saying, I will probably get struck by a lightning bolt, but the Pope needs to educate himself. Is he promoting socialism and communism over capitalism? That, was, that is one of the commentaries to the Pope's homily written today. It's a very important story, by the way. Pope Francis slams the tyranny of markets and the idolatry of money. No different in doing so uh, than Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and all of the other uh, famous leftists of the past. So now you have to deal with this. You have to deal with this. I hope you don't take offense at what I'm saying. We're having a discussion, and this is a, a free market of ideas, it's not a government-controlled show. Took away a tradition of over 200 years. Gabe, he, he's so tough with the American people and so tough with his allies and somehow so passive to the enemies of our way of life. Go figure. So we have a progressive president, which is a code word for communism, socialism, Leninism, Marxism. You can pick from that, that uh, smorgasbord. Then we have a pope who is speaking the, the, the straight-out language of <laughs> liberation theology. Right out of, He's the first non-European pope in 1,300 years. He gives a speech that fundamentally is exactly the same as Jeremiah Wright without any cuss words in it. And that is a controversial political movement that has its roots in Latin America that tied the teachings of Jesus Christ to the radical opposition of the social and economic conditions that create poverty, right out of Marxism. Catholics should be very concerned indeed. Very concerned indeed. Wherever you turn, there's a progressivism that's trying to stamp out individualism, individualism, freedom, everywhere you turn. Pope Francis slams tyranny of markets, idolatry of money. This is a revolutionary homily that he gave. You have to understand that. But maybe I'm the first one to talk about it. I hope I'm not the last. You know, you're talking about Obamacare. This, and I understand that's all political fodder. But this, to me, is a bigger story. The unholy dollar. Pope Francis slams tyranny of markets and idolatry of money. The unholy dollar. Unholy dollar. Ah, God. How did this happen to the country and the world? How does this happen to the world? This is at a time when Christians are being slaughtered around the world by Islamists. The Pope chooses this as a topic instead of the tyranny of Islamism. Instead of saying to Catholics, we must unite and we must circle the wagons in order to preserve ourselves in the church. And we must help our Catholic brethren in Africa. Wherever they are slaughtered, we are there for them. That's what this man should have talked about. Instead, it tells you you're, you're evil if you have money. And give it away. Unbelievable to me. <clears throat> That's one man's opinion. I'm sure I'll be attacked for this. You're not allowed to have an opinion when it comes to religion or politics. My mother warned me when I was very young. She was apolitical, by the way. I never heard her utter a word in her life about politics, ever. But she warned me. She said, never talk about <laughs> politics or religion if you don't want to offend people. <laughs> Oh, mom in heaven, that's what I do for a living. 
That's what I do for a living. It's only talk about politics and religion. They're the only topics we're worth talking about. To be frank with you, that's all. That's all there is to talk about is politics and religion. What else is there? Everything else bores me. Want to talk about Magic Johnson's uh, uh, basketball? Want to talk about some idiot with a pigskin running down a field? I don't want to talk about it. it. Doesn't interest me. If you like it, God bless you. I'm not interested. Oh boy, oh boy, do I have a job. Every day, just when I thought I could get out, they pulled me back in. I mean, it's like, just when I think I can pull out a radio and I've had enough, the news comes the next day, pulls me back in. It's hard to believe. Just when I think I can't take one more day, not one more day of this nonsense and madness in the world and this creeping progressivism, and then there's another giant story. Now the Pope comes out, like Che Guevara. Che Guevara could have given the same speech. Without Listen, without the fiery rhetoric, there's the same gospel that Fidel Castro preached, which is take from the greedy rich. It's the same as that preached by de Blasio in New York. It's the same that's preached by Obama while flying an Air Force One and living bigger than anyone you've ever seen. It's the same preached by those living on gilded golden chairs while telling you to give away your fortune. It's the same double-talking hypocrisy I heard from every quarter of the globe. WABC, Ronald, do you agree or disagree with me? Uh, well, 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 Mr. Savage, thank you very much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Um, I'm a Catholic. I just, I, 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 I'm happy that you've addressed this because I find it quite destructive that the Pope chooses to bash a system, namely capitalism, which has really preserved so many Catholic lives, but then chooses to uh, hail socialism which has been responsible for so many Catholic deaths and really so many deaths in the world, I find it quite um, as an anomaly, really, that he... Well, you have to understand that he is the first non-European pope in 1,300 years. So he has a different perspective uh, than you may have, and he reflects the influence of liberation theology, which is fundamentally socialist. Does he not see how vicious socialists have been in our... No, no, I'm sure he lives in a cloister. I'm sure he lives in his own cloister in that sense. He is probably a very fine man, but politically rather naive. This speech, by the way, is worthy of great discussion within the Catholic Church. For him to slam the tyranny of markets and the idolatry of money, those are fighting words in this time when we're fighting a government that is unto itself socialist and redistributive, redis, well, into redistribution. Let's put it that way. Thank you very much for at least bring it up in your church on Sunday. Ask your priest what he thinks about the Pope's homily, if you call it a homily. Pope Francis decried the unfettered capitalism that has, quote, created a new tyranny. Do you hear this? And an idolatry of money, Tuesday, in the first major work as pontiff. Listen, maybe you're hearing it uh, the first time. I'll read it to you. He says, just as the commandment thou shalt not kill sets a clear limit, in order to safeguard the value of human life today, we also have to say, quote, thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills, Francis wrote in his apostolic exhortation, which amounts to a platform for his papacy. An economy that kills? This is astounding. This is just astounding. I mean, I am speechless Oh, the uh, Jew haters will be out there, but I, I don't think it's about Jewish people or about uh, about ethnicity right now. It's about the fact that Obama has thrown an ally to the wolves, and the question is who's next. It came out today that while Obama was handing away, handing over the right to build a nuclear weapon to Iran, without, by the way, con the Congress's involvement, Iran uh had Iranian missile technicians secretly visiting North Korean technicians to develop a new rocket booster for long range missiles or space launchers. This is at the same time nuclear talks are taking place in Geneva. So you have to ask yourself, is John Kerry and is Barack Obama are they traitors? What are they doing? How could they do this? What do they want to happen? Do they want Iran to get a nuclear uh cap the capacity to launch a nuclear weapon atop a rocket that could reach Europe? What do they want to happen here? Well, I'm The officials suggested the reports were suppressed within the government by the Obama administration to avoid upsetting the talks in Geneva. The officials said, why does this administration want so much 
to negotiate a nuclear agreement with Iran if they know full well that that country is building a nuclear delivery vehicle. So what does that make John Kerry? What does that make Barack Obama? And what does it make them? Recent U.S. intelligence assessments have said that both North Korea and Iran are expected to have missile capable, missiles capable of hitting the United States with a nuclear warhead the next two years. Do you believe this? Can you believe this? This came out today by Bill Gertz in the Washington Free Beacon, that while Obama and Kerry were signing this nuclear deal behind everyone's back without the knowledge of Congress, Iranian missile group delegation visited North Korea to find out how to build a rocket together, an 80-ton rocket booster developed by the North Koreans, long-range missile that could reach the United States of America. You know, if you listen to this, you can get pretty scared. You have to ask yourself two questions. Only There's only two possibilities. They're both pretty, pretty dismal. One, this administration is naive. Just say head in the sand, or you could say their head is in the air, or you could say that they're, they're, they're playing for the other side. Either way, it's a very dangerous situation. Okay, so I think I've said all I want to say tonight. And today, by the way, this just came out. Did you see the top of the Drudge Report? Iran rejects the nuke deal, says the White House is lying about details of the nuke deal. They said that the White House fact sheet is invalid. They said that they have the right to develop what they want to develop. They said that whatever Obama put out is a factually inaccurate primer that misleads the American public. And they said that they have the right to enrich uranium which is a key component of a nuclear weapon. And they said that they have the right to enrich uranium. So Kerry lied to you. Obama lied to you. The entire European Union lied to you. Barbara Boxer lied to you. A pox upon them. They're lying to you. They're letting this rogue regime develop a nuclear weapon who is now working on developing a missile. What needs to happen till the schmucks wake up in this country? What needs to happen? Tell me, what needs to happen? What needs to happen? I'm asking you a question. What needs to happen? I'll be back, Teddy. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. And every day you sell a product that's made in America to the rest of the world. Every time somebody buys movie tickets or DVDs or distribution rights to a film, some of that money goes back to the local economy right here. And believe it or not, entertainment is part of our American diplomacy. It's part of right. what the makes sewer us pipe of Hollywood. exceptional. Part of what right. makes the image us of the American is that of a bisexual, drug-addicted, psych psychotic. That's the image that uh, Katzenberg, Hatzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg send out through the sewer pipe. They're the diplomats of America, bisexual, psychotic, sex maniac, uh, who uh, doesn't know anything about anything. That's part of the... Uh, Diplomacy now. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, if that's what you like, hey, if it feels good, do it. Why not do it in the road? That's it. That's the story. And now they're diplomats. Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg are now uh, uh, diplomats for America. Now, here, here I'm saving the best for the last. Here is a professor who's retired, Noel Ignatiev who urged white male students to commit suicide during his last class, saying that whiteness is a curse and a form of racial oppression. He's a white male. Here he is saying something along these lines several uh, years ago in clip 15. My concern is, uh, is doing away with whiteness. Whiteness is a form of racial oppression. Sure. The suggestion is that it is somehow possible to separate whiteness from oppression, and it is not. There can be no white race without the phenomenon of white supremacies. This is a white male saying his race should be exterminated. Go on the rest. If you abolish racial oppression, you do away with whiteness. Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. Your views are, are fairly well received in academia. Legi yes, they're legitimate. Not to say that everyone agrees, but sure. And the task is to bring this minority together in such a way that it makes it impossible for the legacy of whiteness to continue to reproduce. So he doesn't want whiteness to reproduce, and in his last lecture he said white people should commit suicide. In clip 17, listen to this one. Prison is probably the single institution 
uh, most important institution in the life of black America. Uh, and of course, black folk go to prison even now at a rate, you know, five to ten times as quickly as whites. Now this you all know about. What I wanted to propose is that people begin to think that I want to project to you that this movement should morally affirm itself to be in favor of the abolition of prison. The abolition of prison released the murderers and the rapists now from the prison. There's a white male professor on tenure in Massachusetts, and here's the punchline in clip 18. The United States, like every other country in the world, is divided into masters and slaves. The problem here has been for many, many years is that a whole lot of the slaves think that they're masters because they think they're white. The thinking that they belong to okay. a certain... His final lecture was that whites should commit suicide. That's what he was given. That's what he, we got for giving him tenure. And if you think this whole thing of of whiteness is an anomaly of this psychotic, sick piece of garbage, you're mistaken. Your son or daughter is being taught this day and night, and that's why your son or daughter is a depressive or suicidal. They come out of college hating themselves. They are committing suicide thanks to your universities. Have a nice Thanksgiving. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282.